Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and following. If you have your Bibles there, I hope I spend more time reading the Bible tonight than I actually do talking because the author t- um, to the Hebrews is just going to explain it for us in, in such a way. And, and I'm just hoping to shed a little bit more light to help us understand um, these types of ideas and, and concepts. Verse 14 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. Let's stop right there. Let's pause for a moment. Thus far, he introduces this idea that we have Jesus, the Son of God, who is the high priest, but then reverts back to explaining and talking about the earthly office of the high priest. Does that make sense? So he talks about the high priest who has sins himself, and who has to offer gifts and sacrifices on his own behalf as well as on behalf of the people. And I think that's fair because it then mentions that Jesus was without sin. So he's not ascribing sin to Jesus. He's not saying that Jesus is the high priest because he was the type of person like a high priest who had sins that needed to be forgiven. That's not the case. Okay? That's not the case. Jesus was sinless. Jesus was perfect. He was without blemish. Do you know what blemish means? Marked up, scar, pocked. Back in the day, we used to buy them nice leather, rawhide, rawling baseball gloves. If you bought a nice glove, back when I was 10, it cost about $150. And they were the kind of rawhide leather that it took about a month to break in, playing catch with the hard baseball, greasing it up, pouring oil all over that glove, sticking it under the bed, waking up in the morning before school early because you know you had that nice leather glove that you had to break in and get ready for, for a little league or baseball season. Well, guess what? If you found a blemished glove, there was a little section on those magazines where you can order the gloves or if you went to Sports Mart or Big Five, you can get a leather glove that had a, a, a iron brand mark on it that said blemished. And if you were smart, you go and you'd get the blemished glove or at Copeland's at Delano Mall. You guys remember Copeland's? That was the bomb.com. So you can go and buy a blemished leather glove because it had an imperfection in the glove, but you would get it for like 50% off. So I'd go straight to the glove section and I'd go and look for the, the blemished glove. Like, okay, where's the burn blemish mark on these gloves? You know, I'm working with the budget here, you know, I'm working with the budget here. My dad's a pastor. Come on now. Thank God for the Alpine batting cages and the Tyler family. They practically gave us a full scholarship to hit over there at the batting cages every time we used to go walk down the street, ride our bikes and skateboards. Hey, there's the Canales boys. Go ahead. Hit in cage five. Thanks, Kevin. Don't worry about it. Tell your dad we said hi. It was awesome. Blemish, unblemished. Jesus was without blemish. Us, We're like the leather gloves at the bottom of the glove pile at Copeland's. Half off. Verse 4. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God. Someone say called by God. Just as Aaron was. Okay, did you just catch that? We're not self-appointed priests. We're not self-appointed apostles or prophets. A call to ministry is a calling that is given to one by God himself. That's why you hear people talking about, I was running from the call. We're running from God, the Holy Spirit, chasing after us. The hounds of heaven, we're on our tails. Release the hounds. The Holy Spirit has released the hounds to get after us, especially when we're not serving God and living the way God wants us to live. 
living out our purposes, our God-given purpose to serve him and to love him and to love people and to love one another. Let us continue. Just as Aaron, Aaron was called by God. You know who Aaron was? Aaron was Moses' brother. He was the high priest of Israel during the time of Moses. It wasn't Moses. Moses acted or uh, served as like the judge. He was the, the, the leader, if you will, the spiritual leader of Israel. But his brother Aaron performed all of the priestly duties. He represented the people on, be, uh, on, on their behalf. He, he presented gifts and offerings unto God. He would go into the Holy of Holies where only the high priest was allowed to go. And he would talk to God and he would say, God, forgive our people for their sin. And he would be the one to sprinkle the blood of all the animals that they had to kill. I mean, talk about barbecues all the time. If your family, you know, if it was your time to go and, and offer sacrifices, on you, everybody went once a year. You would go and represent your family. If you were a rich family, you could offer a big, huge, fattened bull, a bullock. You can go and offer that to the priests, and it meant that you guys were wealthy. But you, you offered the bull so that your sins and the sins of your family would all be atoned for. Atoned simply means it would be wiped away. That the separation between you and the other was closed. That's what atonement means. You become at one. A-T-O-N-E. At one. Atone. So the, the, the father or the priest of the home would go and offer the bullock on behalf of his family. Then the high priest would take it. They would slaughter it. They would take the blood from it. Sprinkle the blood on the altar. And then that would represent the cleansing of the sins of the people. And so the, the death of an animal, the blood of an animal, would satisfy or appease God. Don't ask me why. Ask God why he, he needed blood. It was gory, bloody. It was gruesome. But that was just the way it was. And it's called the sacrificial cult. So now, let, we're talking thousands of years have passed. They're still offering sacrifices but yet here we are, the author to the Hebrews has written some, somewhere in between like probably 60 A.D. and 70 A.D. It happened before the fall of the temple in Jerusalem. And guess what? This is like 60, 70 years, or probably no, 30, 30 to 40 years after Jesus' death. So these people, the Hebrews that the author is talking to, were former Jews, former Hebrews that began to put their faith in Jesus Christ, they learned about the life of Jesus, the man who was Jesus, the great high priest, the sacrifice that he was, and the appeasement for the sin of the world. And so because of the death of Jesus, and then, of course, we'd all celebrate the resurrection, which we're, Easter's coming, you guys. Are you getting ready? We should be more excited about Easter than we should be about Dodger opening day on April 6th. I'm serious. You better get ready to prepare. You better get ready to invite your friends and family to come to church on Easter Sunday. You better go and get a nice outfit, a nice suit, a nice tie at least, and get ready for Easter. It's important to celebrate Easter. Can I go on a tangent? It's important to celebrate Easter. You want to know why? Because Jesus celebrated the Passover. We're going to talk about it this Sunday at church. Don't miss this message Sunday morning. We're going to talk about how Jesus celebrated Passover. They celebrate with great feasts, great meals. I mean, people came from all over to Jerusalem to celebrate God's faithfulness and goodness to the children of Israel and how he delivered them out of Egypt and gave them a new hope. Because Jesus celebrated that, we celebrate now not only Passover and recognize what God did in Egypt, but guess what? We celebrate Calvary and the resurrection. So anybody that says celebrating birthdays, Christmas, Resurrection Sunday is crazy. And they're not Christian because they're not following in the traditions of Jesus Christ who knew how to celebrate and have a good time. So I love Jesus. <laughs> Verse 5, part B. But God said to him, You're my son. Today I have become your father. And he said in another place, You're a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. 
You're like, who's Melchizedek? I can barely even pronounce his name. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. You remember, we talk about that a lot, don't we? To the one who could save him from death. But remember, Jesus didn't answer his prayer, right? But then we go around licking our wounds when Jesus doesn't answer our prayers. When Jesus doesn't love me, how could God be loved? I pray for my, my aunt to be healed of cancer, but she, she died and she left behind her children. But guess what? Jesus, who cried with tears, and the only one that could save him was God, but he didn't. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. So God heard him, but he didn't answer Jesus' prayer the way Jesus wanted his prayer answered. Jesus was a human. He was a man who could sympathize with our, our struggles, our pains. Did you read that in the earlier verses? Did you catch that? It's awesome, huh? Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he offered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Let's talk about this guy Melchizedek now. A priest is someone, get ready brother, I'm going to start moving around now. Melchizedek was a high priest. He was one of the first priests that we ever hear about in scripture. He comes out of nowhere. There's a mystique. Not mystique from the comic books. But there's a mystique about Melchizedek because it never mentions father nor mother, nor where he comes from. All it says at one point was that Abraham, after the defeat of the, the great kings, he comes and he runs into this high priest named Melchizedek who was priest of the Most High God. You guys with me? And Abraham from the spoils of war, took everything and gave 10% to the high priest. So the priest then was somebody who functioned as a representation of God himself. If you were a, a spiritual man, if you were a faithful man, if you knew God, you were going to always pay respect to the priest. You were going to pay your tithes to the priest. You were going to pay honor and reverence to the priest. And so Abraham... Being a good follower of God, relatively new, though he was, offered 10% of everything that he took from his spoiled and spoils and gave them to Melchizedek, the high priest. It calls Melchizedek a high priest forever. The author to the Hebrews reintroduces this guy named Melchizedek. And now he wants to make parallel between Jesus, his function, his role as a high priest, but not just any other high priest, the greatest high priest that ever was. Another reason why he begins to introduce Melchizedek and compares Jesus to this man Melchizedek is this. Because the Jews hold Abraham in such a high esteem. He's Father Abraham. Everybody say Father Abraham. Father Abraham and many sons. Okay, stop. Father Abraham, he's revered. He is like legend. He's the father of our faith. Jews, Muslims, Christians. We all trace our roots back to Abraham. We all share the same father of faith. Abraham. Now, if you think Abraham is a rock star, then guess what? There's something special about Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek was placed over Abraham. If Abraham offered his tithes and paid his respects to Melchizedek, there's something special about him. Throughout Scripture, we've heard it said, Moses said, and then somewhere in the gospel you, you hear and see, but Jesus says. How many of you have seen that before? John chapter 6. Look what it says in John chapter 6, verse 32. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it's not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it is my Father 
who gives you the true bread from heaven. Other places in the Gospels, Jesus flat out says, you've heard Moses say, but I say. What is he doing? He's showing that he trumps the word of Moses. That's blasphemy with the Jews. You're looking to have yourself killed by saying, Moses said, but I say. Do you guys see what I'm saying right here? Now then, look what it says in the book of Acts, chapter 11. Anybody heard of Stephen before? He's got a brief role in the book of Acts, doesn't he? But a powerful one, right? <clears throat> Why did they stone him and kill him? According to Acts chapter 6, verse 11, Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. They wanted to kill him. Jesus spoke not to tear down Moses and the institution of Moses or the institution of Israel, but to show that God sent him with the greater message. God sent him who was God himself to reinstitute a new covenant with the people. And they wanted to kill Jesus, and they did. They killed them both. And then I thought, who is the author to the Hebrews? And then I go, could it be that he remained anonymous because he feared for his life? It's kind of a funny thing for those of you who know the word. And it's like, I don't know if it has any validity, but it begs the question in curiosity, doesn't it? This guy was going all along building up Jesus, the new covenant, new Israel, the high priest, Jesus, who is greater than Moses, the high priest who is greater than Aaron, Jesus, who in the order of Melchizedek, now, I want you to see that parallel right there. If Melchizedek was over Abraham, and Aaron, who established the lineage or the line of the earthly priesthood, and everybody throughout the scriptures you see comes from the line of Aaron. It, they kept it in the family. We'll see that Jesus' calling into the priesthood was greater than Aaron's. Why is that important? It's important to us because the early Christian Jews continued to struggle with the idea of their sins being completely forgiven. It's like... I gave my life to Jesus, I got baptized, and now, ah, oh, I mess up, I sin, I jack up. I fail God. Do you remember the time you got baptized and the first time you outright sinned against God, yourself, or your neighbor? How bad you felt? So can you imagine the way the early Jews the early Jewish Christians felt when they were hearing this gospel message that their sin was actually already paid for at the cross. It was Your whole debt was paid for. You don't got to continue to kill the bullock. You don't got to kill the lamb. You don't got to take the blood of the lamb. If you were poor, you would take a pigeon and, you would take, and they would take the blood of the pigeon and that would represent your family. You don't have to do this. You don't have to slaughter animals anymore. Your debt was completely paid for. Jesus' blood paid it all. He paid the complete ransom. It's like some of our mortgages that we have. We're thinking to ourselves, we're never going to end up, we're never going to finish paying this debt. We're never going to finish paying this mortgage. It's like it's everlasting. Our debt is forever. You guys following me? But it's like somebody walked in and said, hey, here's the check. Pay off your mortgage. You're like, but I, don't earn, I didn't deserve it. I, what did I do to earn? Like, don't worry. Don't worry about it. Just here. Oh, my goodness. So that's what it was like for those early Christian Jews. But guess what? They didn't know how to reconcile the idea that they didn't have to continue to offer sacrifices at the temple on behalf of themselves or their families. Because the Jewish faith and religion never stopped after Jesus came, it continued. So the Jews, 
who re- rejected Jesus, who re- denied Messiah. Everybody say Messiah. The Jews who rejected Messiah continued to live under the sacrificial system. They continued to provide sacrifice and gift offerings to the priests at the temple on behalf of themselves and their family. It made them feel better in some way because that's what they were used to. And some early Christian Jews were torn because they didn't know how to just give it all up to God. But how many of you know that when Jesus died on Calvary, the curtain in the temple was torn? And when that temple curtain was torn, it represented that the Holy of Holies was opened up now to each and every one of us to have access to the to the throne, to the to the 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 Holy of Holies, the presence of God. So that though we, we have pastors, I'm a pastor, though you have me as one of your spiritual leaders and Pastor Isaac, you know, we don't we don't we don't need you to go around calling us pastor and doing this. But guess what? In our culture and our multi ethnic context when you call somebody pastor it's a sign of respect right in some other context they call the pastors hey john hey rick hey johnny but you know what i'm i was, I was raised in a, in a latino context you know what i'm saying so like i was raised around called my dad hey 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 daddy hi papa i see other pastors how are you pastor i see doctors at the hospital i call them how are you doctor you know williams dr johnson i'll just hey how are you rick to the doctor You know what I'm saying, though? But anyway, the point is, is that though we as pastors serve as spiritual leaders, our primary function no longer is tied to the sacrificial cult, the shedding of blood, having to represent the people, having to hear the sins of the people, and then say, okay, your sins are forgiven, because we can't forgive anybody of sin. That's between you and God. Right? Right? So when Jesus went to Calvary, guess what? He opened up the lines of communication for us all. Praise the Lord. And that's the whole point, is that Jesus' blood was not shed in vain. And that Jesus' blood appeased God. That when Jesus gave his life on the cross, not only was he the ultimate, the greatest sacrifice that ever was, he was the last And beyond that, the greatest, most high priest we've ever known. That way, when you talk to him, he hears you. He knows us. He forgives us when we repent. He goes on our behalf to the Father. Not me or Pastor Isaac. Let us off the hook. That's why we're called pastors, pastores, shepherds. We have a different role and function in the body of Christ. According to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Let them be equipped with gifts. Some are given to be apostles, preachers, teachers, pastors. So the role of pastor and priest, though similar, they're not the same. We do serve and, and function in a priestly fashion, like uh, Noche Buena. Have any of you come to Noche Buena, our Christmas Eve service? We're serving in the role of a priest, offering communion and a blessing to all the families as a representation in a spiritual way of God's blessing and covering over your families. That's rich, huh? It's beautiful. And I take the calling seriously. I take it seriously, and I thank the Lord. I didn't appoint myself as pastor. I'd probably still be playing baseball right now. I'm serious. I'd be at spring training somewhere playing for someone. No, but when God said, all right, it's time. I said, all right, Lord. You called, here I am. You appointed me, all right. I'll I'll take my spot. So I didn't get to half of what we had today, tonight. I didn't even get to be a uh, chance to read 7 and 8, but I did sum up in, in the form of who Melchizedek is. I'd love it if you went home and read chapter 7 and 8. it would give you an even greater understanding of who Melchizedek was um, and what he meant to the church. 
I mean, you talk about superlatives. That's who Jesus is in the book of Hebrews. He's like the greatest adjective that you can ever imagine. That's who Jesus was. Um, I love him. And I need him. I need him every day. He's my priest. He's my, my high priest. When I pay my, pay my tithes to church, guess what? I'm paying them to him. I'm giving honor and respect to the, the greatest priest ever. That's why when you give your tithes and your offerings, guess what? Don't worry about where it's going. Don't worry about how it's handled. God has called and appointed people, trustworthy people, that will take that and offer it on behalf of the people to God for the kingdom. And those are spiritual seeds and blessings. You know what happened when Abraham gave the tenth and honored Melchizedek? You know what it said? And Melchizedek blessed him in return. He blessed him. When you give your tithe, guess what? Just activated blessings. Woo! Fires me up. He's our high priest. We don't need anybody else. But you will have to live with us. German shepherds. Nipping at your heels, keeping you close to the flock. Amen?